everybody. We're here with another edition of KC Music Talk. Um, my guest today is a guitar player and musician here in Kansas City, uh, Tom the Masters. How you doing, hey, man? How you doing, Rob? That's it's good fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good of you to be here, man. I met you at uh, at your jam, I think. At the Phoenix. Yeah, at the Phoenix with yeah. with uh, Millie, right? Millie Edwards. That's right. Yeah. You guys had a pretty fun jam going on. We did. We did did that for five years. Wow. Every Monday night. Yeah. yeah. That was a that was a that was a really fun time. It was a good. Some of the other jams are. They're pretty relaxed too, but they're they're more full band, and it's kind of it's not it's not hectic. But your guys' was really like like chill and low key. I really like that. Right. And we let if you would come in, we'd get you up to play with different musicians and maybe bring mm -hmm. you back up and mm -hmm. you know different different guys like like you and others. Bunch mm -hmm. of and Jim came a lot. Yeah, I just Jim had Kent. him on the other day. Jim Kent. Yeah, yeah. and, well, and you guys there. had some good players up there. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, we'll get to the we'll get to the open jams here in a minute. I definitely have some questions about that for you. Okay, but sure. um, for for people to, who don't know you, obviously you're a guitar player here in town. Um, but uh, tell tell me a little bit about your your history playing and maybe some of the some of the people that you took from and whatever. Cause, okay. Well, yeah. after high school, I went. I'm from KC, Kansas City, Kansas. Mm -hmm. So after high school, I knew I wanted to keep you know pursue music. And my dad said, well, you can go to any college you want to go to as long as it's in Kansas, mm -hmm. state school, you know. So I started researching, and Wichita State was the only school that had mm -hmm. a jazz guitar program, yep. Jerry Hong. Mm -hmm. And so he's, uh, he's, so he's, he's a good he's player. Quite, quite, the, yeah, quite the player and teacher. And, of course, he had a column in Guitar Player magazine, you know, every week or every month back then for like five years. So, that, so mm -hmm. it was easy to uh, kind of get to know who he was. So I started out with studying with Jerry, and uh, Wichita State alma mater. I thank you. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and before I went to Wichita State, I went to a one-week Jamie Abersold camp. Oh, really? And that was a great experience. Oh, yeah. So, so and Jerry was happened to be the guitar teacher, uh. and Jamie Abersold and Dan Hurley, Ed Sof, Woody Shaw. I mean, all these jazz, uh -huh. heavy jazz guys. But I got to know Jerry in that one week. So when I went. To the next, you know, my first semester at, at, as my freshman, Jerry already knew who I was. Mm -hmm. So that kind of gave me a step up over just over some of the other guys. Cause, yeah. You know, I just kind of had a personal bond with him. Mm -hmm. and, that's and, cool. You know, we're still hanging, we're still buddies. But so anyway, but but that's what I did, and you know, getting in the education part of it. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I, after I got my bachelor's, then I moved to Los Angeles. And studied mm. for one year at USC mm. in their guitar program, and then cut, then took some individual lessons from some jazz guys. Mm. You know, trying just you know trying to get ideas. What can I do to further myself? Sure. <clears throat> and then ended up studying with Steve Vai for about a year and a half, the guitarist with, and he was playing with Frank Zappa at the time. Steve Vai's a monster. And that he's he's become one of the you know I mean and he's plus he's a good businessman. Mm -hmm. he, he knows, oh yeah, he knows how. And even even then, when he was nineteen, twenty years old, he was, I think he was a vegetarian, didn't do any drugs. Mm -hmm. He was just so focused. Mm -hmm. and, and and the lessons, you know, I've I only recorded two of my lessons, which I still have. Oh wow! But I, you know, had I known, you know, what I know now, I would have recorded every one of them. Mm -hmm. Wow! But uh, but that you know, but that was hey, quit, quit name dropping in here. Yeah, quit, stuff. quit, quit. <laughs> but but that's kind of just how I tried to. Further myself, you mm -hmm. know, and just tried to get myself in front of, in front of the best players I could to try to help, help, you know, just to kind of get mm -hmm. get the ball rolling. Oh yeah, that's that's really really smart, man. I mean, you, yeah, you've obviously had some good teachers. I mean, Jerry Hahn was kind of a legend in oh, Wichita. Yeah. I mean, he's well known uh, from the whole school for sure, you know, and um, yeah. I'm sure he told you all sorts of good stuff. Um, the so so. With, with the music stuff you were doing, uh, the first thing I wanted to kind of ask you about is, this is not your day job. Right. Right? That's and, right. And uh, plug, come on, plug, plug your business. Okay. Plug, plug well, your <laughs> <laughs> well it went, when I was living in Los Angeles, I, I, I got married. I was teaching at a junior college, mm -hmm. teaching guitar, and one of my students was my, became my wife. And she she's older than I am, so mm -hmm. it really didn't matter. Yeah. But uh, 
But and she had two little girls that I adopted. Mm -hmm. So my wife Sarah. So I thought, well, how am I going to afford four people playing the guitar in Los Angeles? Yeah. So I said, I just asked her. I said, what if we move to Kansas, back to Kansas City, where I was from, and we'll, you know, I just thought I'd teach and play. I didn't really have any intention mm -hmm. of getting into the insurance business. Mm -hmm. But my dad had this insurance business, and so after about a month of coming to Kansas City, you know, it takes a while to reconnect, even if you're from here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I just said, well, what do you think, Dad? If I join you, so he. <coughs> He welcomed that, and uh, so now, so now I own, you know, the, the Masters Insurance there in Westport. Mm -hmm. So, so that's my day job. That's cool. And you know, and of course, being with the music, it's it's amazing how many musicians, including you, mm -hmm. that I, I have their insurance or have had or you know help them in one way or the other. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. And I, the one of the questions I wanted to specifically ask you because you're going to be able to answer this in a specific way that. Um, I know one thing that happened with me is that, and I've seen this on a couple of different moments where I had this student and he bumped into his teacher at school, right, with his instrument. And so it was, it was kind of explained to me and who knows if they were lying or whatever, but it sounds like it was both of their faults. You know, it didn't sound like the kid was being reckless. It sounds like the teacher bumped into him, but he wasn't holding it very well and it dropped and broke. And so... They, I was trying to kind of talk them off the ledge of getting mad at the teacher and stuff. I'm like, you need to just, you know, because we're talking like a $600 instrument or something. You know, they, it wasn't a ridiculously expensive instrument they were talking about. Yeah. But I told them that probably the best solution for the future is just insure it, right? Just just get your instruments insured right. either, either in your car and house, you know, like kind of normal people with renters or the... Um, or, uh, or car insurance, or go get a personal articles policy, or go, I mean, you, you'd be able to tell me what the things are called, you know, right. but, but go insure it some way. Um, and then we also have some problems of, I'm, uh, we're, we're out at bars, right? And some idiot comes and pours wine on your keyboard, right? Or somebody steals it out of your car, right? And right. Um, can you talk a little bit about- Sure. Instrument well, insurance we've got, and stuff. We've got several, several you know things to consider. If you're, you know, if you're a teacher and or if you're not out playing in clubs or or in an orchestra or anything, there's mm -hmm. different kinds. So you could just get a, a valuable items policy, list your instruments, maybe get them appraised if they're fairly mm -hmm. expensive, or at least, at least know how, know what they're worth. You need the name, the model, the serial sure. number. And get your instruments on a personal, what they call personal items policy. Right. Um, and the only thing is, that's for personal use. Yeah. So that's, right. you know, so it, it does cover it worldwide. It'll cover it uh, if you drop and break it. Mm -hmm. It'll it'll cover it if it's stolen out of your house or your car. But if you're making money and you're playing in nightclubs or in an orchestra, mm -hmm. then you have to get a professional. That, that's a whole different thing, right? That's you're really doing with it, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. So then you have to go to a specialty company that still they'll cover you worldwide, but uh, um, but having it stolen out of your car, that's really probably the biggest thing here in Kansas City, guys. Mm -hmm. go How many it. guys has that happened to? Oh, yeah. You, you see at least, mm -hmm. at least a couple a year. Yep. And usually they've maybe gone to a, a jam session, coming from a gig, and left all their equipment in the car, which I we all do. Yeah, you know, and, and somebody breaks in or mm -hmm. especially like downtown or something in some of these other areas, you know. Yeah. And I think that I, I wanted to mention that because I know it's a little bit of a boring topic, but it's very important when you like get all your stuff jacked. It's horrible, right? I mean, yeah. you get your four thousand dollars worth of equipment stolen, and and if you haven't insured, then all of a sudden you're not really that screwed, right? And yes. if you don't, you're pretty screwed on our, you know, That's all of right. us that have like five bucks in the bank, like myself, <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty hard to get all that back. I had a really nice 1945 Epiphone jazz Ugh. guitar stolen in Wichita out of my car. Ugh. And luckily my dad had insurance, so I was able to wow. replace it. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Some of those things can't be quite replaced the same way though, you know, right. go, go find a 1930s blah, 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 you know, well. Well, you have had, money to go get a new something, a but quick story. I had a customer, and their daughter was uh, quite a, an accomplished violin player and mm -hmm. studying over in England. Mm -hmm. Well, she had her violin on the on the bus or the subway, <clears throat> and fell asleep. Mm -hmm. And the guy took it and just and took off, 
And uh, so they called, and that was a $10,000 claim. Sure, yeah. They paid for it, and yeah. wouldn't you know, less than a year later, that, that violin came back, <laughs> and they got that violin back, and they paid the money back. Wow. They, they'd rather have the violin than the... Sure, than yeah, the oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Most people would, too, if they have a really nice instrument. It's not the money they want. Yeah. They want their instrument, uh, yeah. But that showed, so where she was out of the country, that, you know, Covered. Wow, that's really yeah, that's a cool. I know when I tried to go find instrument insurance in the way that you're talking about, like covering it while I'm at the gig and all that stuff. I went to a couple places and they uh, they didn't want to touch that with a ten foot pole. Right. I mean, you know, some of these other companies, they're like, serious? You know, like, no, we're not doing that. You know. Right. It's it's and, well because they know, that especially if you're playing in clubs, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's different in in churches. Or something you may right. not have, you know, may not have, but right. but it's so easy. You go out and get a drink or something, and come back, and you've left your instrument sitting. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and so uh, yeah. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think that is a thing that we all deal with all the time, especially in Kansas City when we're playing like downtown or in Westport or something, you know, or we're not playing at a church, you know, and yeah. uh, you know, just something that's always, you know. But I'm always happy to, if people want to call me and answer questions, not that I'm trying to sell them something, at least I can lead them in the right direction. Yeah, and that's really nice that you do that, that you, yeah. you know, you don't, because cause you're, you're, you're on that fence of, you, you know, you do have a business to run, but at the same time, you like totally understand their pain, you know, as right. a musician so, and you're trying to help, you know, right. it's a really good attitude to have. Um, so on that kind of on that idea of that of you kind of having this business that you run that is probably I mean you'd say that that's you know pretty much your main thing right, right, right. and then you have this other and you don't really th I, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth I guess but you don't think of that as music as the other right I mean it's kind of a big part of what you do right, right. that's right uh, you know really the first year when I started selling insurance, it was that was the hardest because <laughs> mentally I was I was a musician. Right. I'd, I'd come home from work and I'd tell my wife, I don't think I can do this. She's, yeah. And she'd keep encouraging me. Oh, you know, keep trying. <laughs> oh yeah, you can. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> but but it, it's yeah. As far as a musician, so I see so many guys out there that are such great players, but they they they're not willing to take a day job, mm. and so I see them struggle. Mm. You know, I mean, they're, and, and a lot of guys don't want to teach, you know, so mm -hmm. if you're not teaching and you're not... What's that left with? What are you left yeah, with? Yeah, so you're just, you've taken every gig that you can, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a struggle. Mm -hmm. So it's, so, you know, so having the day job for me, but, but right, I mean, music is really even my own, my logo at my office, you know, is me sitting playing guitar. So I, I incorporate it in everything I do. That's really neat, yeah. And you should. That's kind of a shtick that, uh, that... Uh, State Farm can't do that, right? You know, I mean, you've got this kind of uh, local business kind of thing, at, you know, or right. this like, like you just said, kind of a musical element to your even your logo. That's cool. Um, like you just said, there's a lot of guys that have different. Everybody does kind of a different thing in regards to that that relationship between music and your day job or the no day job or the only day job and then I barely play and like everybody has a different way to Everybody's deal with that. Everybody's got to find that happy medium. Mm -hmm. And I've been lucky that my wife is, you know, she all she's known is me playing. Mm -hmm. In other words, I've played ever since because I was her teacher. And when we first got married, I was playing. Well, when I, we'll get into jam sessions here in a little bit. Right. But, the first jam session I started with was with Mama Ray mm -hmm. at Harlem's. Yeah, yeah. And this was back in, so I was playing, I played, I had a band, or I was in a band, played Friday night, Saturday afternoon, Saturday night, and a, and I played a Sunday game. So I, so I was mm. never home. You know, right, and, and yeah. Then worked all week. Right. And did that for years. Mm -hmm. you know, because my, my daughters say, oh, Dad, they'll, they'll talk about some friend. I don't remember that friend. Dad, you were never home, you know, which, but, I was mm -hmm. supporting the family. Too. Right, yeah, um, you're did, you did doing what you got to do. Yeah, and, and I enjoy playing. Yeah, I, I find, I find that relationship really funny because, mm -hmm. because you'll hear a lot of different opinions about that. Like I was talking to a guy the other day that basically was saying that, like, if you want to do this for real, he was saying that you've got, you've got to do it, you know, and and he's saying like, like really making some headway and really getting to know a million people and getting some really good gigs. 
he's, he, his opinion was you've got to kind of go at it pretty hard. You can't, you can't do this sort of like with a side mentality and then hope to get to this great place. It, right. He was, his opinion was you, there's one of these things that, uh, that you, you kind of got to go for it a little bit. And he was not implying that you don't necessarily, it, that means you can't have a day job. You know, that, that, that wasn't what it is implying, but right. he was saying that, that you've got to be okay with the choice you've made a little bit is what he was saying. You know, if you're okay with doing a, you know, three, four gigs a month at most, and then that's, that's fine, you know, it, at most, and then you have your big day job, then, and you're okay with that, fine. Right. You know, I, I, that's what, I, what do you think about that? I mean. No, that, that's right. You have to kind of know what your comfort zone is. You know, I, I, I like to play, if, if I can play two to three times a week, that's kind of my yeah, yeah. sweet spot. Right. You know, right now it's slowed down a little bit, so I'm playing one to two, you know, so maybe I'm doing seven to eight gigs. Yeah. I'd rather like to do at least about 12, but it, it just. Right. I think a lot of people in town would be pretty jealous of that. You know, there's a lot of guys in town that are okay and they ain't playing 12 times a week or a month, right. you know, so that, that's great that you're getting to play that much. I'm not getting to play that much, you know, the 12 gigs a month, but uh, it's, I, I think it's a really big question that we all have to deal with. All the gigging musicians in town have to deal with that question of, because we're all sitting there in the same boat. They're like, oh, you know, even some of the teachers, they're like, I, yeah, if I had a choice, I would rather go play a gig, but now I'm different because I love teaching. Right. You know, I, it's not a settle for for me. It's it's my day job, and I'm I'm lucky and not lucky. You know, I'm lucky in the sense that I get to have a music day job instead of another UPS day job or something. Right. You know, right. but no, that's right. You're... But we all kept playing, right? That's it. We all didn't quit. We all did. So it's not complete luck, right? I mean, I that's kept right. playing. I had the wherewithal to get a degree, et cetera, et cetera, you know. And that's the key with, with the music business. You just can't quit. Mm -hmm. Just don't give it up. You know, yeah. Just, just keep, I mean, it may slow down a little bit. Mm -hmm. you know, that's okay. Just, you know, but if you want to keep doing it, you can't. So many guys I'll run into that I used to play with or whatever, and they just literally have put it up mm -hmm. and don't play at all. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, it, then you've lost the joy of what you start got in mm -hmm. because it's all about having fun. Mm -hmm. If it's not fun. You know, because there's, you know, hey, let's be honest, there isn't that much money playing no. local gigs. I don't care if you're top guy in town or right. not. I mean, there's some guys making decent livings, but nobody's setting the world on fire. It's no, no. Financially, you know. Nobody's making 180 grand gigging in this town. Right. Nobody. I mean, yeah. Zero. <laughs> you know, like, they, they might be from here, but they don't live here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. But yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think that's an interesting thing that we always need to need to think about is, is the... Um, so that's like, that gets into another question I was going to ask you about kind of making goals as a musician and not, not just that I want to play this song or this, but, but kind of like business wise goals. And, and I know I'm kind of at that moment right now where, cause I think a lot of guys, I don't know if they really have a goal. Their, their goal is I don't want to work at UPS. I don't want to be a janitor. So my goal is I, I want to be. A professional musician and that's the goal and that's not a terrible goal that's not a horrible goal Dave Chappelle said something similar to that where he goes if I if I can make a teacher salary doing comedy I think I've been a success that's good you yeah. know and that that's a pretty awesome attitude to have he's like I think that's success when I so I don't have to be a teacher now I can be a comedian right. and I think a lot of guys sort of feel that way but would, would you agree that if you have that mentality, there's, I know it's a journey, you know, it's not a destination kind of a thing, but if you don't have, if your goal is just playing, right, and then there's nothing, there's no other part of your goal, you know, where, do you think a lot of guys... Right, you've got, well, you've got to, number one, you've just got to have the drive. You've got to know, mm -hmm. I, want to, I want to do something. So I'll just give you an example. When I moved to Los Angeles... Yeah, I've got three real quick ones. I there was they had a local newspaper, you know, so I put mm -hmm. an ad in the paper, jazz guitarist available. Yeah, and I might have had one call, and right. just, and I think all it was was somebody that wanted to jam, you know. Sure. Like, well, I was trying to get some gig, right. so I I ran that for a couple of weeks. I thought, well, that didn't do much. So so I was I was starting. I needed the money, you know. Uh -huh. 
So I put country guitarists available. Of course, yeah. being Kansas City, yeah. I played, you know, I wasn't sure. an expert, but I played some. I bet you I had 10 or 15 calls. And within a week, I was in a band mm -hmm. that we did variety. It wasn't country, but sure. we did variety. Yeah. And, you know, so you have to kind of be flexible, but you've got to put your, put your feelers out. So that, so I got that gig. So I was playing every weekend with this band. Then as far as teaching, I knew I wanted to teach. L.A., of course, there's so many places to teach. So I just... I, I got a map, and I, from where I lived, I said, okay, I don't want to go any more than 10 miles. Mm -hmm. I made a circle. Yeah. Looked up everyone, and I mailed a letter to every one of them. Good and for I, you. And I got two interviews and then got hired by one right in Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. They required a, a college degree, which I had. Yeah. I don't know why, but that's why that was their requirement. You mean you don't know why you had the college degree? <laughs> no, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, so that's, you know, that's how I got that. And then when I was... Then when I was out there uh, and I got this certificate to teach at the junior college level, you know, I thought, well, how am I going to, how do I do this? So once again, I, I wrote a letter and sent a letter to every junior college in L.A. Mm -hmm. And within a week, I got a job. Good for you. So, you know, so you just have to, you got to put out, feet, whatever it is, you know, feelings. Mm -hmm. Of course, now that was before Internet and, and cell phones and all that. Sure, yeah. But, but you were, you were, you some people can get to the point, get to the the point where they can sit there by the phone. Come on, people, call. Come on, come on. You know, but you you gotta you, you gotta, gotta do it yourself, you, you've right? Do you know, something. Yeah. So now with, you know, you've got to have. I would say recommend get a website. You know, more than just a Facebook page. You know, mm -hmm. get a, get a website and put put a little of your own music. Mm -hmm. You know, why why are people? And of course, you just got to get out in front of people. That's right. the biggest thing. Yeah. But at the same time, people, once they hear about you, they, they kind of want to look at, well, let's let's check this guy out. Mm -hmm. And they want to know a little of your history and sure. some pictures. And it doesn't have to be real fancy. Yeah. Well, that, that leads us perfectly into in the next topic of uh, open jams, you know, of getting seen. Um, uh, we, I, I think the open jams in this town are a pretty big part of our music scene here. I mean, there's there's like 15 of them, right? I mean, at least. I guess so. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, if, if you count, like, all the different genres blues. of jazz and blues and rock and country and... Right. Um, the... I think, I think the clubs have figured out that that's one way to bring people in. Mm. They hire a house band. Yep. Pay them, you know, most house bands, you know, if they're making 100 a man, that's, that's really that's good. That's good, yeah. So most are probably not making that, but, yeah. uh, but then they bring in their buddies and then guys want to sit in. Mm -hmm. And and then they bring their friends. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the key. Is right. and that was one thing with when I was playing with Millie at uh, at the Phoenix. One thing that she did that was really smart. When, once a month we would do a showcase. Mm, right. And, oh and, yeah, and, yeah. And feature three or four people, and you know let them play a set each. That was kind of a neat thing. And mm -hmm. so they would bring all their friends. Yep. Uh, and so that and that sometimes the, the place would just be packed. Because mm -hmm. each group brought in their own crowd. Yeah, and that was really neat because you're, because so ex, so explain why that was good for them, for the club. Well, for, for everybody, for, everybody. for all, everybody yeah. involved. So I mean, it, especially the musicians. Yeah. Well, of course, for Millie and me, where we were the hosts, that in a way it was kind of a night off because we might play a song or two, and set it up and let the uh, let the musicians so we'd have the. You guys were getting out of work. Get I know. Yeah, that was the point. Know. No. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> of course, you, but it's funny because you still, you know, there was nights literally I didn't play at all. Yeah. But you still got to be on because you got to you got to have the mic set up right. and helping people getting on and off that little bitty stage. She's kind of emceeing too. I mean, Millie was right. right? I mean, right. kind of yeah. So but, she wasn't but, doing but zero. That, but so that was one thing that you know that we did a lot of jams. A lot of jam sessions don't, but uh, but you know, working with people, I know a lot of the places have a have a list you sign. Sure. You probably go to some of those. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, and because because your guys's was I, I consider your guys's more like a your guys's was set up a little bit more like an open mic style I'd say I don't know right. if you agree with that or not than right. like for instance Dave Hayes band theirs is like a true open jam where they have a huge mixer board drums bass I mean a full band your your guys was uh, I know you played a lot and then uh, Alan came up a lot too Alan right? Monroe, right yeah. And then Jim, uh, Jim came up, played bass a little bit, help you out, and uh, and so like, so I, so, and and they're uh, they're great opportunities to go meet everybody, right? It's kind of what the the, 
the yeah, um, yeah get, get, getting in front of people right part that we were talking about yeah and uh, I don't think I would be where I'm at in town or where, wherever that actually is <laughs> but you know how, however big I am but uh, the, you know I wouldn't be able to do this show right now with all the people I've met if it wasn't for the open jams you right. know your guys and, and Dave's and, and you know the yeah. ones at knuckleheads and all the all of them you know and so well, and, and just showing up like when I first met Tim Whitmer who I play with on mm -hmm. Saturdays yeah when I first met him years ago, I'd met him and, and maybe sat in, you know, one time, some, wherever he was playing. Mm -hmm. Next time I saw him, he said, hey, what are you doing tomorrow night? Yeah. He needed a guitar player yeah. just by me showing up. Yeah. And then I kind of started playing with him on and off. And, then, you know, now now for the last eight or nine years, I played with him steady mm -hmm. every Saturday at the Phoenix, you know, mm -hmm. just from that connection. And so, and so, and sometimes like we think of the jams being for the, cause everybody knows there's like a little bit of a, a hierarchy going, you know, there's guys that are like gigging full time, like a Mark Lowry is, you know, he's gigging full time. He doesn't need to go to jams. Everybody already knows who he is. They know how good he plays. He already has gigs. And then you have, you know, the other kind of level of guys that go, that go to the jams a lot that don't quite have gigs all the time that are still kind of learning but guys like yourself still benefit from still going to the jams after you're sort of established right, right. It, and it you is. see that a lot you see that a lot with guys that are still g going to gigs but they still come back to the jams right well and it's a good way to meet people that you don't know because it mm -hmm. you, you know when you start gigging a lot what happens is you're really out of the scene because you're in the scene but you're out of the scene yeah so that's, that's why funny. hosting a jam session is great because people come to you. Yeah. Like when I played at Harlings with Mama Ray, mm -hmm. everybody I met came to my gig. Yeah. It wasn't right. my gig. Right. I was on, but, you know, yeah. I, was, I was in the band. So like, I mean, literally every you know from Pat Morrissey, Phil Brenner, Kevin Mahogany, mm -hmm. Everett Devan. Yeah. They all mm -hmm. showed up at you know which was so I mean I was just there every Saturday so I met all these people. That's cool. Yeah. That's really neat. Um, and so, I mean, that, that's one of the reasons why I think the jams are so successful and, and that they're such a great idea for all of us and that we need them. I mean, we, we the scene, you know, the scene wouldn't die without them, but, it, but it's a great, it's a yeah. great thing that everybody can get noticed when it, like immediately in town and, and, and come here on a when, Monday and go to a jam on Wednesday and you're, you're already meeting people two days into town, right. you know? Well, and, and it's, and it's kind of up to whoever's hosting it. To kind of make it fun and and to get it, make sure everybody gets up. Mm -hmm. That's number one, and that and that's a trick in itself. Sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes you have some really good players, you know. So you kind of want to get them up and let them stretch out a little bit, and then you have some more that aren't re aren't very good at all. Mm -hmm. But you have to make them feel, mm -hmm. you know. Of course, some jams, you know, are, are different. Some jams they don't really let the the beginners in, you mm -hmm. know, whatever. Certain levels. What do you think about that? Well, it's, you know, I mean, that's okay if, you know, like I went to some jams in L.A. that were some real heavy. Yeah. You know, so so it just wouldn't be appropriate for, for somebody that didn't know the tunes. Mm -hmm. to, but at the same time, locally, here, it's, you know, it, it's it's kind of nice to at least, at least give them a shot. Mm. You know, play, play yeah. a song or two. Because I would say, I would say an example of that in our town is like the foundation. You know, I mean, you, you they're, they're, they... Place has been going 80, whatever, 100 years or something. Charlie Parker and Count Basie met each other. And, like, I mean, it's had some pretty good history. And, and like, I personally, I don't blame them. Like, the, the people kind of at that establishment going, like, you know what? We, we have a reputation here. We, you know, we're going to make it kind of known that you, you know. You have if you screw up, it, it happens. We all screw up solos and whatever. But... You, you kind of got to need to have your crap together before you come down here. Blue Room might be another one, you know, where they right. kind of expect you to sort of kind of know what you're doing. And we're, we're, we're not so, we, we don't love the riffraff, you know, we kind of want some real stuff going on in this place, you right. know? Oh yeah. And like, so, so I guess my question, and cause this is my show, I get to ask the questions that I think are interesting. <laughs> It's but, the PC uh, Music Talk with Ron Exactly, Hall. yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's an awesome name, by the way. It's awesome mostly because I came up with it. <laughs> but uh, um, but so the, the one thing that I find funny is that 
I know that like the jams, for example, that all of us sucked at one time, you know, even when we get, even when I got into town, you know, I'd played a long time, but there was, they were starting to call Night in Tunisia and like St. Thomas and some of the, you know, I never heard any of these songs, you know, it, it really wasn't the, the deal that I wasn't like talented enough to be on the stage with them, but like jazz wise, I didn't know any of their songs at all. Right. You know, and that's why I loved the blues jams and stuff at first, because I, I kind of could just get keys and I didn't have to completely know the songs. So so everybody starts out with that moment where we all kind of have to suck for a while, you know, and I, I definitely get that. I definitely want to, as a, a kind of, I'm not a veteran, but I've been to like 250 jams now. I feel like I'm kind of a jam veteran now right. with how many I've been to, even though I'm young. But I definitely understand that we all got to have some patience with that you know if you're if you're a a mark lowry or some somebody lonnie mcfadden or somebody who's like really good you know who's been playing 60 years and they just you know whoop everybody right. i understand that all of those kind of people need to have you know patience with the younger guys but it is Wynton marcellus was saying something on a video i saw about the negotiation of of musicians on the stage you know about this drummer likes being in front of people, but he doesn't want a solo. He doesn't want anybody to really see him. Right. And then the guitar player up there's the prima donna, and he's taking over the stage, and you know he's and right. so we all have this like like it's uh, a balance. It's, a, it's kind of a balance, and and I have to admit that when I go to jams, I'm I'm hustling. I, I'll admit it. You know, I want everybody in this town to know who I am. I'm trying to get gigs. I'm trying to you know I want to play the best. I want this musical experience to be the best. Because I want to look, you know, not look the best on stage. I want to look the best I can. Right. Showcase my abilities. And so it, it makes it, it is frustrating, you right. know, when you when you and, get up with other guys. And of you course know. the frustrating part is, especially when it's a jam session, if they're getting you up, usually they're switching other guys at the same time. Sure. So you might get up there with a drummer that's a rock and roll drummer and you want to play a jazz tune yeah or a bass player that has no idea what it is you're doing mm -hmm. so that's it's a little tricky you know and sometimes I'll go to a jam and I'll have guys tell me well, I, you know I want to play with you but it's not my call yeah mm -hmm. you know I mean well that'd be great if you know if, if it works out but it's mm -hmm. a, but don't be disappointed if the leader calls they got to do what they got to do right but, yeah so I guess my my question that I've been asking all of these guys that are that go to a lot of jams is kind of sometimes the either the guys that are really really clueless you know they 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 really think they're something and and they got nothing you know and they they're really clueless about rhythm and and intonation. songs and intonation and they and or the guys that are that know they're not very good but then we get them up there with other people it's it's definitely frustrating when i'm trying to hustle and this is my livelihood and then i get up there with you know and you know i'm not talking about the guys that are that can logistically do it right they can get up there they sort of know some chords they can generally get the rhythm they can generally look up the end of songs you know i'm talking about the guys that are like have have kind of no business being on stage right what is your opinion about jams generally having like a a baseline of ability before you get up at a jam? What what would you say to that? Yeah, oh yeah, I I certainly agree. You've got to if you're a singer, you know the biggest thing with singers know what key you're going to sing. In. Know your key. <laughs> you know, know your lyrics. Know your key, and don't get up there and be looking at your phone. Mm. You know, I mean, mm. if you're a, that's a singer, but that's my my main advice. You know, if you're going to mm. sing, know what key you're singing in, because in you know, unless you have an Alan Monroe or somebody that's perfect pitch, they can pick it out. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it, because the, the whole band's just standing there until somebody figures out, and then mm -hmm. okay, we're in B flat. Or whatever. Right, right. But uh, yeah, but it's at certain levels. You just, you, you know, and maybe in, in with Millie and me, we would, if it was more a beginner, we would get him up with her and myself rather than sure. in, invite the other musicians. We'd just let them get up and play with us a tune or two and wouldn't have the other musicians. Yeah, make the jammers deal with it, right? Yeah, yeah right. and that's... So, that's so, so the house was, band deals yeah. with it, and then yeah. we start getting the good yeah. jammers up, you know? Yeah, that, that's a really good solution to that problem, I think. And, uh, 
And like, I just, I like, it, it's just, it's just frustrating. And I know when I say, like I just mentioned what my opinion is of that, it sounds kind of harsh, you know, and, and I, I understand that people are always learning and stuff and, and we, we have to start somewhere and people like myself or you or whoever need to be patient and understand that they're, you know, and I just, uh, I just wish that people were a little less clueless, you know, sure. and, and yeah. the cluelessness is a, an example of that is what you just mentioned about, I'm going to get up and sing, but, oh man, I need to know a key, you know, and like, and well, it's a I little, think, I think know. shows like American Idol and these X Factor kind of people just, uh, just think they can sing. They just have, mm. they have no, no clue. Either maybe their mom told them they could sing or yeah. something. But they they have no experience, you know. I mean, but that's I guess what jam sessions are for. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing on that is that I I also have another theory on that is that when you have this guy that that see and the thing that I think is funny about this is nobody wants to call people out. That that's what that's what kind of really drives me nuts actually about it. But what everybody loves to do is go in the back of the bar and talk crap. You know, like, and, and so every, and so that's what I mean by like the, everybody's thinking it, it's the big elephant in the room that this guy is like the jam killer right now, you know, everybody, you know, so he's, he got up there and he made 10 people out of this place basically leave yeah. and, and all the musicians are chattering in the back, like, oh, duh, that guy sucks. And so everybody's saying it, you know, in, in back, you know, back, not to his face, right, right to yeah. the jammer's face. And I think that I have this theory on that. Like, cause like me, is it, is it my place as the jammer to go up and basically even, even in the nicest way I can, is it my job to kind of come up to this guy? You know, probably not, probably you know, not. and yeah. even if it, even if I would do that, you know, sometimes I don't have the same kind of status as like a Dave Hayes or Paul Greenlease or maybe yourself that yeah, yeah. You've, you've got, you've got to know how to get them on and get them off. Yeah, yeah, and you know that you just you know, and that's without hurting anybody's feelings, and and that's the key. You know, it's mm. it's I've I've learned you know just just you know and of course sometimes they'll get up and they'll just just stay up there, especially maybe and sometimes that's true with horn players or or single instrument. You Accidentally know, stay up there, huh? Just stay stay up there and you know and and you even ask them to say okay you know thank you for coming, and you kind of are cluing them that okay this was it was great. And then, so you bring up another jammer, like say I bring you up, and then this horn player gets back up. Yeah, I've had that happen. Yeah, uh -huh. and of course. Yeah, some, and, and, and some jammers, some guys just get, just come up and start playing without being advised. Yeah, uh -huh. that's that's kind of a big no-no. Right, right. No matter who you. Are. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah, I guess enough on that. But uh, yeah, that's just something that I think about a lot. And the the part of the reason why I keep saying that I want to do this is I wanna I want to. J Jim told me last night, he's like, are you trying to get me in trouble or something? You know, trying to call out, you know, the other, right. other band guys and other open jammers and stuff. And, you know, I'm not, I want to talk about the elephants in the room. That's what I want. That's what I want to do this show about, you know, right. Right. how do you get better at music? You practice your scales, you yada, 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 you know, I mean, that's the boring stuff. I want to talk about the elephant in the room that all of us talk about behind everybody's backs, but then nobody wants to really get a good right. solution to that. So that's why I kind of mentioned that. Um, well, and one last thing with, yeah. when, with a jam session, you know, if I go to a jam session, I'll have three, two or three songs in my head mm. that I feel like everybody I'm going to play with can, can jump in on. Yes. And doesn't, doesn't have to be real basic, but it's something that I know the guys can, yes. you know, we can hang with. And so, so they say, okay, Tom, bam, you know what key it is, mm -hmm. you know what the song is, you can, the guys, yes. you know, the guys will sit right in. So you've got to know ahead of time. Yes. Rather than just get up there and, and kind of flounder around. So yeah. That, so that's I love that. And that's that's part of it. The cluelessness I'm talking about is a lot of different things. It's knowing your key. It's uh, having the ability to not not get up at a blues jam and call giant steps. You know, it's just like, you right. know, you've or got, some equivalent know. of a ridiculously hard song that nobody's going to be able to do right now. You've got to call like Thrill is Gone, right? Or Big Boss Man right. or like Route it, 66, blah, blah, you know. Make it fun. Make it fun. For yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. Um, uh, so la last couple of ones that I wanted to talk to you about a little bit is um, what was the thing in a previous band that you, that I, and you can answer this a couple different ways, that, 
that didn't really work that well, or a thing in the band that you that you re that really worked really really well? Do you have like of previous bands you've been in? Well, uh, I would say one that worked really well is is uh, had a band called the Duke Elephant Band mm -hmm, which was mm -hmm. in the '90s, and I had a bass player that I played with quite a bit, Rick Hewitt. Mm -hmm. So I'd played with him, and we kind of talked about putting a band together, and didn't really know who all to include. So I'd been playing at Harlings with Mo Paul, who's a harmonica mm -hmm. player, singer, plays in the uh, what's the name of his band now? The uh, the old, it's the Old Crows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I love Mo. So anyway, so I introduced Rick and Mo, and uh, we had a drummer, good drummer Sam Johnson. We just so I you know I kind of had I knew these guys. So I just went out and booked a gig. Mm -hmm. Just yeah, I was able to, it wasn't anything fancy, it was a club downtown. Yeah. And we had one rehearsal mm -hmm. and went in and, and it and we played together for ten years. Yeah, wow. You know, it just and it just gelled and we played mm -hmm. some played some high profile, you know, gigs. That's so, cool. so so that was cool. You just kinda have to know what you want, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it, but but what you know, things that don't work. Well, is it before we get to that, so why did that work though? Well, why did that band, do you have a theory on it? Yeah, I think just, number one, the personalities gelled pretty well. Mm -hmm. Mo, Mo was a great singer, and I also sing, but I, I would probably sing in a night maybe six songs. Mm -hmm. He'd sing maybe 20 songs. Right. You know, so I always consider myself more of a second-tier second, second -tier singer. Sure. Um, and then Rick Hewitt sang a little. So we'd, so we'd have three-part harmony, and the, as we developed, we, we just kind of kept coming up with songs that we could develop. Uh, the, you mm -hmm. know, some harmony and to share, share the stage. So not everything sounded the same all night. Mm -hmm. But you'd say probably the, uh, so you talked a little bit about the musician part of it, of the music playing, and you had the harmonies, and, and everybody kind of gelled that way. But you thought the personalities gelled pretty well, right? And yeah, and that's important. You know, you got to be buddies. Mm -hmm. You know, it's because I I see some bands that when they take a break, everybody just disappears. <laughs> They don't even talk to each other at all. It's like you know that's you know because I that that's half the. Is fun. that like marriage or something? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but that, that's half the fun to me is to, to see the guys that you know. I mean, not not that you have to spend every break with them, right? But, but at least you know at least uh, have some connection. Yeah, yeah. Have some connection. It helps a lot, doesn't it? Where oh, you're yeah, not at each other's throats all the and, time. And I'd yeah. rather play with guys that are you know really glad to be there. Maybe not the best musician in the world, but mm. glad and showing a good energy. Yeah. Rather than a guy that's that's really good, but he, you can just tell he's just not into it. Yeah, and that's really big because I, I know I've had that a lot where I've been thinking of those. You you have the the level ten, you know, but they're flaky or they don't have a good attitude or whatever, you know. And then you've got this other guy who's a six or a seven and plenty good enough player to play in your band, and he's good. But he has this great attitude, and he's easy to work with. You know, you you're saying that you would obviously rather choose the well, guy for, with a good me, attitude. Yeah, you it, know? it just makes it because if it's not fun, you know, we mm. keep going back to that. But it's got to be, it's got to be fun. Yeah, no matter how bad you need the money, I mean, it's just like it. Right. It needs to have some sort of appeal, you know, besides exactly. for money. Exactly. Yeah. What was something that What was something that didn't work? Oh well, I had, had one experience. Years ago, when I was in, in Wichita, uh, I was teaching at a store, and this guy came into the store and said, I need a guitar player for this weekend. And he, he played at like a VFW hall or mm -hmm. something. He was a country singer, guitar player, you know, strumming, strumming mm -hmm. guitar player, played the bass drum and a kazoo. Mm -hmm. So he brought me in, you know, to just play lead guitar. Mm -hmm. And he, of course, the, the poor guy, he was terrible. But and and he and he was demeaning. Every, after every song, he would he would right. com complain about how I played, right on stage. You know, I'd never even met this guy before, and, uh, and then he called like uh, left my heart in San Francisco, which I'd never played before. He had, of course, he had no music, and he and he didn't know how to play it, <laughs> and it was just disaster. And, and he just and I he had just put me down so much. At the end of that set, I said, you know what? I think I'm just gonna go home. And he, wow. said, yeah, and he was okay with it, I, you know, but that's the only time I ever left a gig. Wow. But I thought, well, I don't need to put up with that. Yeah, wow. That's funny. I mean, that, yeah. I, I know moments like that happen to everybody eventually, you know, they just get with a guy and he's, uh, I mean, that's back to the attitude thing you're talking about. You yeah. Know? You know, it, it's, 
And, and besides the, the one gig that I never made, I got hired for a wedding reception, mm -hmm. and I never found the church. <laughs> <laughs> I, never, I never heard from the bride. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> it was before maps. Yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. Were you, were, was it just you? It was just me. It, <laughs> it, 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 it was just you. Yeah. <laughs> I never found a church. Still to this day. Still I'm still unaware. I'm still unaware. <laughs> I'm still. Oh, my God. Oh, that is so funny. Um, yeah, that's funny, man. Uh, so, so two, two more, two more quick ones for you. Um, I got, I, I'm always fascinated, uh, recently about after I, after I was able to run my own band, um, I was always fascinated by the roles of everybody in the band, like, like in, in regards to the business side of it, not playing side, but all the kind of other stuff. And, I was noticing that in, in this town, there's a couple of different kind of types of bands. So the one type might be like Lonnie McFadden, where he's the headliner, it's his band, he's, you know, you know, dictator over, you know, and, and he's just going to hire dudes and he's going to basically tell them what to do. And that's, right. that's great. You know, the guys, the other guys don't want responsibility. You know, they want to come show up and uh, he's bringing all the people, you know, Lonnie has a name and, and. And then you have kind of the other style, which is a little more like family sort of style, where you have a little more, a couple more cooks in the kitchen, sort of, you know, right, where right. it's not really one, you know, dictator leader. And then you have a couple more, like you, you have kind of like a leader, but you have like band members. And then you have like the hired guns so, sort of mentality instead of just one and the others. Right. You see, you know what right. I'm saying? Like, right. like our band is like that, where the three of us, uh, are kind of all the band members and we all three work as kind of the leader at some point. Right. And then we have a couple other guys we kind of hire and they don't really help with much, you know, you know, and, right. and we're kind of okay with that a little bit, right. you know, right. cause you're, cause you probably played some gigs without them too. You played just the three. Right. And yeah. And you've seen us with, with a duo and stuff right. before right. but, um, but I always find it funny that relationship there when you have a guy who is a studio, you know, hired gun kind of person, and then you, but you want them to be the member. You know what I mean? Like right. they're, they're committing X, Y, and Z amount to the band, mm -hmm. like effort or time or whatever, and then you kind of are mad that they aren't helping you book gigs or, you know, do, doing a little bit of the, helping you bring people to the shows, right? right. Helping you load in, uh, you know, can, right. can you talk a little bit about that, about sure. what, what is, what is appropriate, like expectation for somebody that isn't pulling their weight or whatever? How, right. how, how have you? Well, it, you know, it, I mean, the different groups that I'm in, the, the ones that I've really enjoyed playing in, it, you know, you you help each other out because a lot of times I've owned the PA. I'm the I'm a singer, mm -hmm. so you so somebody's got to have a PA, but it but it's nice. I mean, the, if the guys you know just help carry in the speakers or whatever, you, at least because because some bands as soon as the gig's over, everybody packs up and leaves themselves, and so the guy with the PA or the drums or whatever is left at the last carrying everything out by themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, if they're the leader and maybe taking a leader's fee and that's the way they want it, mm. that's okay. Yeah. You know, but if, and he's just hired side men. I play in groups like that where right. I'm the side guy and, and they really don't even expect me to help because they're they're making more money and, and, they, yeah. and that there's a reason for that. But if you're in a band... They, they've kind of negotiated that at first, right? They've set those expectations a little bit, like Lonnie, right? I mean, Lonnie's going to probably, you know, not be making the same as the other guys. Probably, and, you know, I don't know, but probably, yeah. yeah. Right. I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but, but but somebody like, yeah. Somebody like that. So, so you know, it's, it's if a guy, you know, especially young people are trying to put a band together, I mean, it's, it's a good idea to try to, I mean, somebody's got to be kind of head up have an idea of what songs they want to do and mm. but if they're you know it's kind of fun to, to be a democratic a little bit mm -hmm. and everybody at least have some input and uh, and share and you know carrying the stuff you know most bands split the money evenly of course you know but in the jazz world there's a lot of guys that do take a leader's fee and, and that's you know I figure if I agree to do a gig for whatever they offer me I can't really worry about what they're making because I agreed to that to that fee you know so mm -hmm. if I find out they may double me 
so be it. You know, yeah. I, I'm the one that agreed to it. But they, they were the one who went out and booked all the gigs, right? And they're, right. they're really doing a ton of the work, and the guy gets to accidentally sort of show up and leave. Right. And he's right. not really doing much. He's playing the gig, and that's literally it. Yeah, exactly. so, so that's pretty fair, right? I mean, that's... That's exactly right. Yeah. And so I like, and the reason why I'm mentioning this is because I think this is, in my opinion, the number one reason why bands break up is because of like personality differences or expectation differences. And so I'm trying to, you know, give some opinion or some opinions from other people, you know, and share them with others. Because I I don't know if you agree with that, but I think that's probably the number one reason why people just, they start hating each other or whatever. They start arguing. And my buddy said that, he was he was talking about that family style band where there's not really one dictator and there's you know everybody's allowed to sort of share some some input and whatever he said what what happens when you get five liters right that so doesn't that, work that, so well that you know that doesn't work either but it is but as far as promoting it doesn't hurt you know like if you have a facebook page i mean everybody has their own page everybody put it out there you know mm-hmm. And do do make some effort to try to get, you know, if, if each member can can be at two or three people, mm-hmm. you know, because because when the, the problem playing in a town like Kansas City when you play so much you play week after week after week, well your families eventually they're not gonna come anymore. Yeah. Right. And then your closest friends, well they might come once a month mm-hmm. because you're saturated your your audience. Yeah. yeah. So then you just have to be the best thing you can be is just be the best musician you can be an entertainer. Yeah. And the people that are there, your goal is for, if they can stay and have one more hamburger or one more Coke or beer, mm-hmm. then you've done your job. Yeah, yeah. and, that, and that, that's really important because I, I think you're absolutely right because that's what a lot of musicians talk about with the bands in this town is that like you come see them once and then you come yeah. see them that fifth time and a lot of times people, that, that's, our, our town is a jam, a jammy town. I, I know I've heard like Jim was talking about the Northeast isn't like this. They don't have 14 open jams a, a week, right. you know, but, but even, even our shows are kind of like that where everybody takes the mentality of let's, let's pick some accidentally pick some easy tunes. So we never have to really practice. And then we go out and play the same easy tunes. And then you see us seven times in a row and it's kind of the same thing, right. you right. know? And so like, and so that's tough bringing people, right? If you're going to have the same right. uh, crap oh yeah. every time. You have, to, you, know? you have to kind of find out what, what is your niche. You know, are you going to, you know, what style of music and mm. find something, you know, if you're doing some original or whatever. But uh, I've always liked is different bands. It's like if somebody walks in, let's say if I was playing a cool gig and you walked in, it's, it's fun to invite you know, sure. Somebody, but but that doesn't always, you know. But I play in, in other bands where they that never happens. Yeah, they, they, they don't want that. They, yeah. yeah, and and I and I always understand. Uh-huh. Like when I go see you know a band at the Blue Room or something, I never expect to be oh, asked. Sure. Uh-huh. Asked to be sit in. Sometimes they ask you. Uh-huh. And a lot of times, yeah, I, I you know I don't even take my guitar for that reason. Sure. Oh yeah. Yeah, and then that's another reason why I was saying that, that it's still even a jam town where people will actually get you up on stage when it's not even your show, you know, and that, that's right. like, it's a sit-in kind of a town and just go for it kind of, and which is so cool. Like, and, and, you know, uh, and if it's the right crowd and the right place and the right, right band, that it, it kind of adds a little more excitement. It's oh, like, yeah. oh, well, look who, look who came to sit in, you know, we didn't know he was coming. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's always nice when somebody that you respect like actually comes to your show, like another musician we're talking about. Right, you know, right. that's always a cool feeling for the band. Yeah, so. that's right. And, yeah. and I, uh, I will plug one thing. I've got uh, yeah. uh, on Facebook. We have Kansas City guitar players, mm-hmm. and we, you know, we've invited. You know, we've got like I think five hundred members now. Don't have to be a oh, guitar wow. player, but try to get guys. They can put put their gigs on there. They, you know, anything anything they want to talk about. And then I also have a website, kcguitar.com, mm-hmm. that, that lists, uh, you know, my own personal oh, sure. mu- music website. But what was the first one? The K- first one? just uh, for Facebook, Kansas City guitar players. Mm-hmm. Just and it's yeah, a, so it's everybody a, come come check that it's out. A, it's a group, and just it has to be has to join, and we'll get you in. That's Doesn't have cool. to be a guitar player, but it, but it's kind of nice having a group that way. If you post, you know, all these other guitar players are going to see it. You know. Mm-hmm. That's cool, man. I, I love that you're doing that. And that, I was talking to Jim last night, 
doing it during the interview about how awesome our music scene is for networking, you know, and yeah. how it's, it's, it's cutthroat here because everybody needs gigs, but, but everybody can't afford to hate each other. You know, we just can't afford to do that. Everybody really likes each other here and we, we all, it's you know, a small town. it's a small town and there's a lot of good players here, but, but you, you've got to get out to the jams and know other bass players or, and not like a ba like Jim, you know, not hating on all the other bass players. He's got to know them because sometimes they call him for gigs and exactly. he calls them for gigs. And well, and, and one, one last piece of advice, if I, if you, if you have a band and you hire me and I'm playing in your band and somebody comes up and says, boy, I really like you guys. I want to hire you for my wedding reception. Well, I've seen a lot of guys pull out their own card and mm -hmm. give them their card, but it's not my gig. Yeah. So, I, you know, I should give your card. You yeah, know, the so band card. Give yeah, the band yeah, card. Yeah. Say, hey, Rob, you know, give her your card. She, yeah. she likes the band. That's it. But that's it, etiquette, right? It, I mean, it, yeah. It just, yeah, it's just band etiquette. Yeah. It's, it's that's right. You know, it's it's uh, it's one thing if they say, "Boy, I really like your guitar playing. Do you teach or something?" That's more on a personal level. But if it's if they're wanting to hire the band, don't give them your card. Yeah, that's pretty weak, right? I mean, yeah, that's... and I I see that. I've seen it a lot. You know? It's shady. It's, it's a little shady. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool, man. I got uh, got one one more for you here, okay. and uh, um, another reason why I wanted to do the show was because I am really fascinated by people like getting into the music scene, which I kind of feel like I am, even though playing wise, I've played quite a number of years, even though I'm young, but gigging wise, I'm still a baby, you know, I'm still in the baby stages of finding gigs and getting known in town and stuff. And, um, so not, not for like kids, but for these like 20 ish, 30 ish year old people that are, that are kind of trying to get into the music scene, trying to start gigging, going to jams, whatever. Um, Got any uh, got any good advice for for those type people? How to how to get into it? You mean whatever, or? anything you know, playing wise or business wise or, or getting to know people or I mean, you got anything? Well, I, that, yeah, know? I would say the first thing I'd recommend is if you're new to town or if you're is to maybe just go just go check them out. Mm. Don't even take your instrument. Yeah. Just just check it out. See what see what songs are playing. Maybe even make a note. Mm. You know, okay, here's here's the kind of tunes they're doing. Because I so many things, you know, with jams, it's maybe they come in and it's just not appropriate for the room. Yeah. So get a feel for the room, and maybe some jams you'll go to and say, "Well, that isn't for me," and mm -hmm. just that way you check it out beforehand. Then next time, mm -hmm. take your instrument. So that's that's just a that's just an idea, you know. Treat it kind of mm -hmm. with fresh eyes. Just, yeah. just go in and and support. You know, when I try to try to go out and hear bands as often as I can, I don't get out that much, but a couple times a month. And just go hear a band that maybe I know the guys, maybe I don't, and just just support them. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's really good. And I guess you're probably meaning obviously the open jam specifically, but but even to go check out what other bands are doing. Right, exactly. You know, and, and like what songs are they playing? Right. You know, and and that talking about like you want to do, like let's say you're a person that wants to do uh, Ramblin' Man or something. But this is like a jazz jam, right? You know, and, and the, you're you're getting up there and you're calling like Sweet Home Alabama, and they're like, yeah, that, yeah. So you've got to know, you know, you've got to know, you know, if, if you want to be hitting all these different jams, you've got to be able to be a little versatile. Yeah, yeah, and you need you do need to be able to versatile. But I guess what I'm saying is that kind of again goes back to my clueless word, <laughs> you know, of, of people kind of not really understanding that, you know, right. You need to kind of know what you're listening to and have a, you know, be, and I like your idea of going in and writing some songs down. I know I've done that before, but. Uh, right, or at least, and if you don't know what the song is at the end of the set, go ask, ask guy, man, what, yeah. was, what was the name of that song? Mm -hmm. or, you know, what key are you playing that in? Yeah. You know, just, and that, that helps. Then when you show up where they're impressed, wow, he, he knows Billy's bounce and F. Right, you know, yeah, yeah, right. Whatever. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah, yeah that's cool. Yeah, you know, GM says we could talk about it all night long. Yeah, I know they're they're <laughs> great. You know, I, I I just love them. They're like, I'm I'm a huge huge fan of the jam sessions, and and that's probably one reason why I'm so like pissy at them so many times because I do love them and I wish they could be, you know, even all of us wish you know, they could be better in some ways. But they're I, I do 100 percent support that that's and, you know. and what, one last thing if mm -hmm. you're a, if you have an you know if you're a guitar or, or you have an amp violin or whatever mm -hmm. is not to be too loud 
Mm-hmm. Some guys get up there, and they're louder. Right. They're louder than the house band. You know, mm-hmm. you got to be really sensitive. Yeah, yeah. It's you know, it's, it's you got to be heard, but you don't you don't want to be blowing everybody out out of the water. That goes back to the clueless conference. Uh, <laughs> that to me, it always goes back to people just being clueless and not even understanding that they're like so loud. Turds, complete turds. <laughs> So I would say, you know, yeah. with, with, I don't know, are we about to wrap it up or what? Yeah, probably, yeah. But, you know, yeah. just the best thing is just enjoy, you know, just enjoy learning and, and get out and have fun playing with the guys, guys and girls, and, you mm. know, just, uh, and, you know, and, and then start putting your own band together mm. and try and, and maybe go to a jam session with your own band. Mm. Some jam sessions will let the whole band get out. There. Right, yeah. Especially sure if you prearrange it. Right. Like three, three tunes or something. And then, mm-hmm. then you kind of start getting to know, and the next thing you know, you start getting good. Yeah. Didn't it, what did you say right at the beginning before we started? It was like, uh, no, it wasn't keep learning. It was, uh, it's had a good piece of advice right before we started here. It was like, uh, keep learning or what? Oh, boy. What was it? You know, I'm almost 60 in my, my memory. <laughs> I, I probably don't remember that. That's all right. Yeah, that's all right. Um, <laughs> you, uh, you got anything else, man? I think we've covered a lot. We've I sure appreciate lot. you having me out. This was no problem. exciting. Yeah, yeah. And good luck. Good luck on your on your new adventure. You're going to be putting these on YouTube, mm-hmm. I guess. Is mm-hmm. it? Yeah, I'm going to try to try to get all the all the uh, the best musicians in Kansas City on on. on on the show and oh, ask cool. them, picking their brain about all sorts of stuff. All right. And um, you can uh, you can check out Tom all over the place here in Kansas City gigging a lot and um, and then uh, say that say that website one more time. Uh, the, my website is yeah. kcguitar.com. Yeah. And then for the guitar player on Facebook, it's Kansas City Guitar Player. Yeah. So you can just search that. Yeah. Come come check that out and. Um, uh, we'll be back next week with a, with another uh, KC Music Talk talk interview. All right. See you guys later. See you later.